Um, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Arnan, or Roger. Um, I'm a professor at the um, Department of Computer Engineering at Chiang Mai University. And I also um, run the Learning Inventions Lab there. So today, I'm going to talk about the work that we do in my lab. Um, so the title of the talk is Making, Making Tools for Makers. So I apologize for the cryptic title. I promise I won't do it again. So I'd like to start with a video that shows you what type of things that I'll be talking about. So this is going to be a video of a group of makers making something using the making tools that I've made. All right? <laughs> so I did it again. Um, the goal of showing you this video is that I hope that it will make you think that you know this is something that um, you wouldn't expect seeing a group of high school kids doing. All right? So it's in Thai, so I will explain what they're saying. So this is a motorcycle with pet protection system. So if you're riding your bike and someone is riding you, and someone is riding you, there will be a seat to press. Okay. แล้วจะส่งเอสเอ็มเอสไปหาเพื่อนเพื่อนจะส่งเอสเอ็มเอสไปหาเพื่อนเพื่อนจะส่งเอสเอ็มเอสไปหาเพื่อนเพื่อน
which some of you may know will attract the insects and they would fall into the fish uh, pond and become food for the fish. Right? So that's sort of her duty to go and feed um, the fish by turning on this light. And she would have to leave it on for about two to three hours and then go back to the fish farm again to turn it off because insects only come out during um, early night. So it's really a task that she thought could be automated by using the tools that she'd learned during this program that I was doing. Um, so she invented a system, she adapted a relay board that we had made for another project for this fish farm idea. So, th so what she did was that she attached a light sensor to the Lego brick and then used that to detect when, when it gets dark and then turn on the light by using the relay switch, leave it on for three hours and then program it to turn itself off. And so this is how it looks like. Um, that's the light sensor and um, that's the relay board. That's the little Lego brick there. And everything worked pretty well. And I was really impressed by this project. And it was a highlight of my master's thesis. So thanks to her, I graduated. Um, anyways, it didn't end too well. And this wasn't in my thesis, though. Um, because the next day, she tried to show the system off to her parents. So her father came and said, OK, this is good. You're done with it, right? So her father demanded that she take the system. Right? She did, he didn't want her to leave the Lego brick there um, at the fish farm. And the, the re only reason is because her father was afraid that someone would, someone would steal the Lego brick because it costed more than his salary. And so we ended up having a really nice project that didn't sustain because of this particular reason. So from that day, I was really interested in you know how can we design technology that would fit into situations like this. Um, and I was trying to see you know, if one day I can recreate learning stories like this, but one that has a happy ending. So um, the question for me back then was really how to design technology that, that, you know, that not only makes people interested um, and use in a classroom context, but cannot sustain in real life, but something that really works. So I came up with the design of you know, what's called a go-go board. And you know, this was back in 2001, so that predates the Arduino, if you know that system. Um, it's a low-cost, open-source um, environment, um, uses locally available parts, easy to build, you know, single-sided PCB. Um, you can make it yourself um, with basic chemicals, and it's very likely that you would find all the necessary parts in your local electronic street. Um, it supports the use of diverse materials, um, mostly found materials, so you don't have to use Lego motors or Lego sensors. You can use um, sensors that you can buy in the um, electronic streets, or um, better yet, repurpose sensors and motors from broken electronics. And you know, there have been many projects that you know was created by the Google board in the past decade. Um, basically, you can do autonomous robots with them, like this is a book opening system. Um, for the disabled, um, so it has a foot paddle you can step on, you know, either direction, and it flips the page of a book. And all of this is constructed out of, you know, um, cardboard and you know, simple motors and, and light sensors. Um, you can make interactive games with it. This is an example of a boxing game. Um, you know, create. They wrote a computer program that reads the sensor values from these gloves. Um, so it offers a very nice way to extend your programming project in the physical world. It can also do data logging. So this particular teacher wanted to monitor her sleep pattern because she says that she, um, she moves a lot during, during her sleep and that makes her sleep not, not very um, enjoyable. So she wanted to see what time of night, you know, what kind of situation makes her um, move during, during the night. So this is a pillow. Um, it has touch sensors underneath and then she could log you know, she could count the amount of movements um, that happens through the night. And there are countless projects that has been done um, with the GoGo board um, throughout the years. Um, many organizations have adopted um, the GoGo board. You know, we have uh, Schlumberger, uh, the oil company. They have their own foundation. Bradesco is in Brazil. They have a network of schools in their country. And in Thailand, it's the Siksapatana Foundation that. Um, is doing a lot of work with educational development um, because it's open source. You know, we've seen you know a bunch of people from different parts of the world using the Google boards in their own 
projects. And it happens well because of the design, you know, that you can easily make by yourself. And it started off with something that looks like this in 2001, and now this is version 4.6 in 2013. And all through this year, these years, it has never been commercialized, really. You know, it's sort of like this side project, my hobby that I've been doing um, on the side. Um, but today, things might change a little bit with the newest um, version of the board. Um, so this is the pie topping board. Um, and it works with the Raspberry Pi. So it's sort of like an add-on to the um, Raspberry Pi. And what it offers is you know, the ability to do robotics with a full computer. And, and I think that has a huge implication. And it allows the kinds of projects that you saw before with the motorbike. Um, so basically, uh, this is the Raspberry Pi. It's the Pi topping here that allows you to connect your different kinds of sensors. Um, the Raspberry Pi has an I.O. port, but it doesn't support analog sensors, so that's what the Pi Top thing offers. And it also has circuitry to drive motors, you know, DC motors, stepper motors, things like that as well. And it has an infrared receiver. So you can do a bunch of things that would have been difficult to do before. So because it's a full computer, you can make use of a lot of off-the-shelf devices that are low cost. So this is sort of like using found materials again for me, but in a different context, in a different way. So previously, when the GoGo -Go board started, we were using scrap electronics, um, which is cheaper, you can find it anywhere. Um, now, with the Raspberry Pi and the Pi Topping board, you can use a lot of peripherals that are available off the shelf, instead of going to a specialized store. And there are a lot of benefits from that. So let me show you this particular example of a robotic pet. Um, so this is what it does. So there's a screen that you can touch. It wiggles its tail, it moves to you a little bit. Now if you tickle it on the side, there's a touch sensor that so responds to that. So there's a little USB microphone here, a uh, speaker here. This is a smartphone, so we're using the uh, screen um, to uh, we use a remote desktop application to access the Raspberry Pi. So it's a pretty uh, simple way for you to um, have a touch-sensitive input-output device for your, for your project. If you compare this with the al current alternative, the popular way of doing something like this would be using the Arduino, right? So to use the Arduino to do that particular project, you would need to have all these peripherals, right? You have to get a motor driver shield to drive the wheels. You need to have like a sound shield so that you can play audio. You can have, you need to have a screen um, shield so that you can create a screen. Now buying these things might not be difficult if you have the money, but just imagine how you would program all these things to work together. It's definitely not something that you would expect secondary or high school kids to do. So, comparing that to the Raspberry Pi and the Pi Topping, we use the Pi Topping for the tickle, the tickle sensors. We use the Pi Topping to drive the motors um, and also the tail. And then it has built-in audio, so we just connected a USB mini speaker here. We had a Wi-Fi um, USB dongle um, here and then connected to the um, smartphone. The best thing about it is the programming part, like I've mentioned before. Um, with the Raspberry Pi, you can use something like Scratch, which is a programming environment designed specially for kids. Now, we've, you know, since Scratch has become open source, we've modified it so that it supports reading sensors and controlling motors with the, Raspberry, uh, with the Pi Topping board that we've developed. But just to show you how easy it is to create an interface you know, with Scratch. So I have here the modified version of Scratch. Um, I've imported two pictures, right? The pictures of, you know, the pet uh, with different expressions. And if I want to make it touch sensitive, I just put in the block when script one is clicked, I would do switch to costume that is called pet smile. I would play an audio, which I have imported called panting. And then I would switch it back to the idle face again like that. So when I run, 
and you can imagine this being, you know, displayed on a smartphone. Uh, sorry, a smartphone, right? Running full screen like this, and when you tap the smartphone, that's what it does. So very simple for kids to um, create. Impos almost impossible to do with the um, alternative approaches. So this is the full program of the robot. So not too complicated, not as simple. I mean, just about right, I think, for secondary and high school children. Um, so we've tested this um, platform um, a little bit um, this year. So we've had people, um, students, creating projects like um, this is a theft detection system for a jewelry store. So it has an RFID system. Every piece, every item in the store has an RFID tag. If you remove it, um, it'll uh, the RFID reader will pick that up, and then it would sound an alarm, flash the light, send an SMS to the authorities through an air card. Um, you know, we've developed some Python image processing libraries to do face detection. So a couple groups uh, made use of that. Um, this is a sort of anti-helmet door. So if someone tries to enter a jewelry store with a helmet, you know, there's a camera, and it would prevent that person from entering by not unlocking the door. Um, so this is using a simple webcam and the face detection library that we have for them. It has also found a place in a more serious context as well. So this is a project that 7-Eleven asked me to help them with. Um, they wanted to conserve energy in their stores, um, especially their lights. So uh, they wanted me to create a system where we would turn off some of the lights in the store when the ambient light or the light outside is bright enough. Let me show you a quick video of the system. Yeah, and it's in Thai, so I will, I will explain. So what's, what's the Autolite project? So he's basically explaining that you know, we will turn off some of the lights in the store. If there's sufficient light from outside to keep the brightness in the store within the standards. So right now they've turned off about half of the lights in the store. There's a bit of a delay. So we've installed a bunch of light sensors in the store that would help the system decide when to turn off the lights. I'm just going to skip a little bit. Okay, so this is the control box. There's the Raspberry Pi and the Pi topping board there, a couple of relays in there. Okay. Alright, so um, that's the Pi topping, that's the Raspberry Pi underneath, 3G air card, bunch of relays, um, power supply and all that. So it's being used in this real system that is still working today. Um, so basically, you know, it determines the amount of light in the store, right? And then if you need to turn off a few lights, it does that through a relay. Um, there's a camera that takes a picture of the store um, and s sends it up to a web server so you can debug. You can actually monitor which lights are being turned on and off. Um, it also plots a graph of the um, brightness in the store as well. Uh, so you can look it up online. And it's sent to the server through a, through a 3G air card. So that's sort of the uh, platform that we're working on. It's quite new. We're still improving it. Um, but our plan is that we will do a Kickstarter campaign with Kano, which is a company in the UK. Um, they're doing a lot of you know, work with the um, Raspberry Pi. They've recently, well, they're actually doing a Kickstarter campaign right now to offer nicely um, packaged Raspberry Pi for schools. Um, they were aiming to get $100,000, but I've checked this morning and 
they've gotten $1.1 million already and still have 12 days to go. So, um, you know, the collaboration between us and Pano started before that. So we felt a little lucky that, you know, maybe we can ride on that success a little bit. So we'll see. The plan is to do this campaign next year. Um, okay, so that's, that's sort of the story about the tool that we're doing, um, which I think is quite ready to mature and um, I hope that good things will come out of it. But the thing that I think is also important, not only is the technology, but the learning process, which I, to be honest, I haven't really figured out a way to scale very well. Because creating good learning um, environments and opportunities for kids is, is still pretty hard um, from my experience. So going back to the 7-Eleven project, it's not a project that I did myself. Um, I don't typically do engineering projects like this. I accepted this project because it was a learning project. Um, the idea came from students at a 7-Eleven school, and the idea was to have my students, you know, sophomore students, implement the project. So this was interesting to me because it would offer sort of a real world experience to my students, allowing them to work with other students as well. So in order to make this project a success, you know, they had to learn concept of you know brightness you know what's a lux as a unit and what's the standard of 7-eleven um, of, of the brightness in a 7-eleven store so 750 lux is their standard um, so how do we make sure that the light in the store doesn't go underneath that um, they have plotted out a few possible points to place the light sensors and they had to come up with their own ideas of where to actually put the light sensors and you know, they were smart enough to chose the darkest part in the uh, store. And it involves kids installing things in the real store, you know, debugging in real settings, um, you know, doing things that a computer engineer might not expect to do um, in his career, and, you know, experiencing relays exploding, um, you know, deciding where to put the webcam um, so that you can see all the lights in the store. All of this, I think, contributes to becoming a true engineer. So I think this is really the power of you know, using technology for learning. And it's very context specific. So I cannot replicate this for the rest of my students. Um, so that's why I think it's pretty hard to do. Um, OK, so the platform that I'm using to create learning environments for um, students, um, not just in in my department, but for schools as well, is through the ITM Robotic Camp. And we've been doing this for five years already. And um, so it involves students coming to a camp you know, from schools in northern areas. Um, teachers will bring students um, to this camp. Um, we would do typical robotic activities, but then we would lure them to do projects as well um, when they go back to school. So we give a small grant to them. And we would do school visits, um, you know, this we've found that a teacher has replicated our robot in her own school using her own sort of materials, which was nice. You know, this was a project that we were helping to support, you know, an automatic um, water pump project. Um, the student had created a model of the system using the GoGo -Go board, and it was so good that we tried to implement the real thing for them. So this is us going to the school transforming their idea into reality. You know, climbing up the water tank, installing sensors, um, installing the control box, and that's the control um, box inside. The condition was that even though the tools have changed, but the program needs to be the student's program. So that hasn't changed. Okay, so that's basically what um, we're doing at the Learning Inventions Lab. Um, there are a couple other projects that we're working on. If you're interested in that, I can talk more about it later. So um, thank you very much.